um, in the book of James, and we've been talking about uh, the idea that this is a book that has an emphasis on uh, a faith that works. Not just saying you believe, but putting your faith into action. And today our topic is when you've been snobbed. Now, I don't think snobbed is actually a word, but you know what I mean. Uh, the word snob is. And so uh, the Webster says this, a snob is a person who attaches great importance to wealth, social position, status, it lists a whole bunch of things, and has contempt for those that person deems inferior, or regards himself as better than others in some specific way and behaves undemocratically, unfairly, with favoritism, that kind of thing. Then it says like a, an intellectual snob who just thinks they're smarter than you. Okay, um, Some things just ought not to be in the church. Some things should not even be in Christianity. Uh, one of them is prejudice. There should be no prejudice. Uh, where I prejudge somebody. I, I haven't read the book and I'm judging it by the cover. Prejudice it should not be in the church. Uh, the second thing is inquisitions. <laughs> you know what that is? Persecuting people who you disagree with. We do that. Uh, not in the way they did in the Inquisition. I mean, we don't put anybody on the rack and you know, tighten them up and try to stretch them out or anything like that. But we, we, we do attack people for a lot of things, which ought not to be. Ought not to be. The third thing is snobbery. Just thinking you're better than somebody else and looking down your nose at them. That should not exist in the church. Why? Because we are all image bearers of God. All of us were created in God's image. And so every one of us has intrinsic value and worth, if not to you, at least to God. We're all equally image bearers of God. Now, I say snobbery is incompatible with Christianity and all that I just said because the text says so. My brothers as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ don't Show favoritism. Don't favor some person over another person. It's incompatible. First of all, in the text, he says, my brothers. Could have said, my brothers and sisters, because that's the idea here in this, this term. All of you who know uh, uh, Jesus as your Savior, you are a son of God or, quote, children of God. You're a child of God. So we're all in the same family. We all have the same father. So if we all have the same father, we're all out of the same stock, we're all the same. Snobbery, it should not exist in the church because we're family. Uh, second thing I noticed is because of our faith. We all believe the same, don't we? Don't we believe in God as our Father, Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit is the one uh, who has transformed my life and is changing me and helping me move from a, a not so a sanctified life to a sanctified life so that I'm living more righteous and holy every day? He says, it's incompatible with our faith. It is snobbery. He goes on and he says, it's incompatible with our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that that other person in the church that maybe you just think you're a little bit better of, of than, or, or that person that's in another church that you just think you're a little better than, or that we uh, got our doctrine all together and they don't, and so, you know, we're better than them? Uh, do you realize that Jesus died equally for that person as he did for you? In fact, I believe if there had been no one other than myself, or if there had been no one other than you in this world, Jesus would have died the same death just for you. And he would have done that if they'd been the only one, and he would have died just for them. So this whole idea of snobbery is inconsistent. It's incompatible with who we are as Christians. Totally incompatible. Next, he, uh, in the passage, he gives us an illustration of sn snobbery, and I do so, it's by not such a hypothetical situation. It is a hypothetical situation, but you'll see it is not so hypothetical. Here's the situation. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. That's, that's possible. I kind of looked at that, and the guy's got my suit on. 
You see, it's possible that that would happen. Uh, that, that someone would come in here and they, they got the gold, the fine clothes, and, and he says, and a poor man in shabby clothes would come in also. That's possible. This is a hypothetical but very probable situation. Here's the reaction. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, hey, here, sit down front. All right? We've got a good seat for you. In fact, we're going to put you in that one. <laughs> you said, well, no, that's not, okay, we're going to put you right here in the front, right next to where the pastor always sits. Man, you know, because you look like you've got a lot to offer us. You see what I'm saying? He says, uh, put the poor man, you say, hey, stand Stand there in the back. Uh, here, you know, I'm going to sit with you, but here, just sit on the floor next to me. I'm going to keep an eye on you. I'm going to give you a low profile. Don't want everybody to see you here. You're incompatible with who we are. He said, whoa. He says, here's the motivation. He says, you got wrong motivation. Have you not discriminated? Have you not discriminated? Have you not prejudged? Have you not already passed a sentence among yourselves and you have become the judge and you're a judge with evil thoughts? You already have conjectured evil thoughts that that person isn't worthy. This ought not to be. The point is, it should not be in the church. It should not be in Christianity. It should not be a part of us. Church is to be a place where class distinction break down. It is where color of skin is meaningless. It is where political parties are insignificant. They really don't matter. I say I'm here we're in a political season. It's, it's a very divided, hostile environment. I watched online where a, a man had a, a sign in his yard and a neighbor didn't like that he had a political party sign in his yard because he was of the opposite party and went over and took it out and threw it down. And every day he'd go do this, so the man wired his side. And that's where the fire up funny party part is, because he goes running over to take the guy, guy's sign out, and he gets a little left jolt, okay? And then he, he, he runs off, and he doesn't come back. But it, and the guy had set up a camera and caught it all on, uh, on so it's on YouTube. You can, you can see it. <laughs> but in the church... It ought not to be. You should be able to be Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green Party. You could be a no party. You could, in the church, whatever that other person's thinking is, it's their thinking. And you know what? God made them an image bearer and gave them a free will to, to, to will whatever they want to will. And we just love them the same. We accept them as a brother or sister in Christ. Where money and status and rank and name and title, apparel, smell, size, looks, personality, age. I don't know if they cover it all. They're all meaningless. Because in Christ, we are all one. Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another that I love this person even though they're different from me. They don't cross their T's, dot their I's like I do. I love that person in Christ, in Christ. You see, snobbery is inexcusable is what he goes into next. For several reasons, it's inexcusable. First of all, for God's sake. Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor? What? God chose the poor, he chose the least in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, to be rich in faith. Truth is, I'm just a sojourner, I'm just passing through, I'm a pilgrim. This is not my home. My citizenship is in heaven, Paul says in Philippians, where I'm waiting Christ to return and, and my real wealth, my real value is not here. It's not in the stuff. It's, it's in none of it. It's all about a relationship with God. That's what it really means. He says, hasn't God chosen, God chosen the poor? 
Those who are of faith, they're going to inherit the kingdom of God. He says, but you have insulted the poor. Now, this whole idea that God has only chosen the poor is, is also brought up to us by the Apostle Paul. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Hey, God has chosen the lowly things of the world, the despised things, and the things that are not. You know, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. That means that Jesus chose me. You know what he told me right in this passage? Say, hey, Dennis, you're a fool, you're weak, you're lower than low, you're despised, you are nothing. Do you get that? If you know Jesus, you can plug your name in there too. Jesus said, I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me is to bear fruit. In that passage, he talks about how he prunes the vine and everything in John 15. And he makes this statement, without me, you can do nothing. We are nothing without him. So how in the world could I think that I'm better than someone else and be a snob when the Bible says everybody else, the whole world, should be looking at me as the inferior, not the superior, because I am nothing. It's very humbling. In fact, uh, this whole Bible doctrine of God choosing us is such a humbling experience. God did not choose us because we are somebody. He chose us because we are nobody. It's exactly what he said. So that no one may boast. You know, I can't go pat myself on the back and say, Dennis, good job. You believed in Jesus. And that moron over there didn't do it. You see what I'm saying? I just discredit his mentality because he didn't. He's saying, no, the reason he chose me is because I'm lower than that guy. I'm nothing. So it is incompatible with being a Christian to have an attitude of snobbery. Totally incompatible. I go on, and he says here in this passage, for logic's sake, it is totally incompatible with being a Christian. It's not the rich who are exploiting you. I mean, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Poor people aren't giving you a hard time. The, the, the people you think that are less than you, they're not giving you the hard time. Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Who? The rich people, the one you think that is so wonderful. Aren't they the ones making life for you miserable? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of whom you belong? Aren't they the ones who are opposed to the name of Christ? and you're giving them preferential treatment to a brother in Christ, it ought not to be. We're family. Third thing he says, another reason why uh, it ought not to be, for Scripture's sake. If you really keep the royal law found in the Scripture, now I notice he says royal law. In the book of Deuteronomy, it was required when the nation Israel would get a king that the king would have to write out the entire Torah, the first five books of the Bible. He would have to write them out, and then he would have to keep them with him all the time so that he would know how to rule God's people. It's the royal law. It's the one the king wrote. This, this, this king is supposed to know God's law because he was to be the king over God's people and, and he was supposed to know what God wanted so he would reign the way God reigned. It's called the royal law. What's the Bible? If you really keep the royal law found in the scripture, it's called love your neighbor as yourself, taken right, lifted words right out of Leviticus 19, 18. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart. That, that, he, he, he says here that we're to love the Lord with all of our heart. Jesus was challenged when, uh, he, he, about 
what do you got to do to get into heaven? And he said, well, you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and uh, the man said, well, who is my neighbor? Thinking, well, if I don't know who my neighbor is, how in the world can I keep that law so I'm off the hook here? And, and so Jesus told him the story. You know the story. There, there was a, a Samaritan that was going to, down the road to Jericho, and, then a, and, and we got this Levite and the priest that come by. Uh, <clears throat> We got this, actually it was a Jewish fellow that fell, fell uh, in the hands of thieves. It was beaten up and this Levite and this priest come by. And when they see him, they see that he's all beaten up. And they just cross over on the other side of the road and keep on going. They're not doing anything for this, this guy. Now, I find something very interesting in the text. It tells me that the guy was beat half to death. Half to death. And he's in a really dire situation. And they're not there to help. Years ago, a, 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 a bottle washed up on the shore on, on, on the California coast, and a man went over and kind of rubbed it and cleaned it off, and out popped a genie. And the genie said, I'll grant you any three wishes you want. Only one thing, the way my genie ship works, your worst enemy, I have got to dub, doubly bless. Whatever you ask, they get double. He said, I'll tell you what, that's fine, I don't care. He said, I want a beautiful girl on my arm. Boom! Immediately, there was a beautiful blonde girl on his arm. He looked down the beach, and there was this, the guy that he hated, despised the most in the whole world. And all of a sudden, boom, boom, there's two girls, on one on each arm. Oh, man, the iron inside. He said, well, listen, I want a million dollars. Boom, a chest full of a million dollars sitting in front of him. And he looks over, and it, the other guy, two chests full of a million dollars. He is iron really up. He looked at the genie and said, I want you to beat me half to death. I know you catch up with that. <laughs> Half to death is an expression we use that he really got beat up. He's really beat up. So much so that the priest and the Levite who are leaving the Jerusalem, going home from worship, they pass by on the other side, don't have anything to do. But then a Samaritan comes along, and, and, and the, his audience knows the Samaritan is, uh, uh, they discriminate against Samaritans because they're part Gentile, part Jewish. And so racially they discriminate. And uh, they live in a different region and, and they despise them. And, and so he's telling a story. The Samaritan looks at the Jew, who, Jewish man who's all beat up, and he has, the Greek says, splankna. That's the term. It, it comes from your gut. Your guts are just, he's got compassion the way it translates it. He's got that deep, sunken feeling when he looks at somebody who is a, who's hurting terribly, and he has, he has compassion on the man. He goes over and he helps the man, puts him on his, his donkey, and he, and he takes him to an inn and, and tells the man there, uh, keep him, and, and listen, I'll be back. Whatever it takes to take care of him, when I come back, I'll pay for it. And then Jesus looks at these, these the disciples, or, or these Pharisees, and he says, uh, which one was the, the neighbor? Oh. And the Pharisees just can't stand this because they have to say the Samaritan and they won't even pronounce those words. They said the one who was neighborly to him. <laughs> See, there's prejudice, 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 partiality, partiality, discrimination, discrimination. It, you know, it was going on. Back then it goes on today. And he says in the church it ought not be for the scripture's sake. We are to love our neighbor as ourself. He goes on and says, for sin's sake. But if you show favoritism, if you discriminate, if you show partiality, you sin. I couldn't put it any plainer than that. The word sin means to miss the mark. You got the target there, you're shooting at the bullseye, and the bullseye is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. You pull back the arrow, you shoot, and you're way off. You miss it. Anytime I got favoritism in my heart and I'm giving preferential treatment to one person over another, I have prejudged and I have sinned. I've missed the mark of what God wants for me in my life. He said, and you're convicted of being a lawbreaker. You're convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. You see, there were 
two tablets. The first tablet, I think, carried the four, first four commandments all about God. That's love the Lord your God with all your heart. The second tablet had the other six on it, and those were the ones to love your neighbor as yourself. And so you can sum up all the law in this, these two expressions, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do those two things, if you live that way, you will automatically fulfill what the law requires. Because if you love your neighbor, you're not going to covet his possessions, covet his wife. You're not going to murder. You're not going to lie. You're going to keep. If you love, you're going to do what is right. And the same goes for the first tablet. If you love the Lord, you're going to do all the things that are right. You'll do it not because you've got to, because it's a law, but because you want to, because you love the Lord with all your heart. He says, you're a breaker of the whole law. Why? Why would if I break one, I'm a breaker of the whole law? He says, for whoever keeps the whole law yet and stumbles just at one point is guilty of breaking it all. Here, what I want to say is this. God never gave the law to save you. He gave his son, Jesus, to save you. He gave the law so you would know that you're condemned and you needed a savior. Listen, if you, if you break it in just one point, uh, anybody ever told a little white fib of a lie? That's it. Just, that is the bare false witness. You realize that, right? If you offend in one point, you're guilty of breaking the entire law of God because it stands all as one thing, God's will. You're a lawbreaker. So if you've done the slightest little thing, you need a Savior, and the Savior is Jesus. That's why he sent him into the world to save sinners, those who have broken the law, so that you can be set free from your sin and have a relationship with God. You can have peace and forgiveness, tranquility. You can have eternal life. You, you can have everything that goes with it. He goes on and illustrates this for you. He says, it's four. Here, let me explain. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you don't commit adultery, you keep yourself morally and you know, sexually pure, but you go kill somebody, you're guilty of breaking the law. You're guilty. You've broken God's law. You've broken it. You've sinned. He says, snobbery needs to be eliminated. It needs to be eliminated. There are four actions here. Uh, that we need to take to be liberated from snobbery. The first action is I need to speak and act on God's word as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. The law that gives freedom. That royal law gives me freedom. Remember, we, we've talked about this for like three or four times now. Does the law of the tracks, you see, there's the law of the tracks, they, do they restrict you? I mean, the train runs on the tracks, so it only goes where the tracks tell it to go. Are you, are you limited by the tracks? Are you limited by God's law? It, does it limit you? Is the, is the train most free on the tracks, or is the train most free off the tracks? And I've showed you this high several times now. But repetition is the mother of all learning. <laughs> you are most free when you do what God wants you to do. And your life is a train wreck when you say, oh, no, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to go off the tracks here. I'm going to go off the track. He says, uh, I need to act on the freedom of God. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. I have the freedom to either do what God wants me to do or do what I want to do to treat all people without partiality or to be prejudiced. I'm free to do that. What he's saying is choose to do what is right. Stop doing what is wrong. Don't be a snob. Be a spiritual person that gives blessings. Bless those who curse you. Bless those who abuse you. Bless those. You see, I am not like the world. He says, act on love. I, I get this from going back to verse 8 in the text, that you love your neighbor as yourself. If I will truly love that other person as myself, and that person's in great need, when I'm in great need, I go get it to set aside. I get that need. I have a great appetite. Mm, I'm really starving and hungry. I look for... 
fast food place to stop and get something to eat. <laughs> I go to the fridge, I get something to eat. There's somebody who is hungry and starving, what do I do? I give them something to eat. I love my neighbor as myself. Act on the love of God. Then he says, act on the judgment of God. He says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives liberty. Whoa. One day I'm going to give an account of what did I do with the word of God. What did I do with loving my neighbor? Not that I knew the verse, could quote the verse, recite the verse, and tell stories about the verse. What did I do with the word? Listen, Paul says in Romans, you then, why do you judge your brother? He goes on to say, listen, this judgment I'm talking about is prejudice. Or why do you look down on your brother? Being a snob, why do you look down on someone else? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Whoa. One day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to give an account of how I treated the other person who is less fortunate than myself. He says again, Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. The, the judgment seat here, the word is actually bema. Uh, and it's different from the crino places of judgment. It's the bema. The bema was the, the stand. There were three levels uh, of the standing. You either got the gold, the silver, or the bronze. It was used for the ancient Olympics. Only they didn't give the, 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 those, those things. They gave laurel wreaths. And, and it was a reward for having won the event. It was not a place of punishment. It wasn't like going before a, a, the judge and he's pronouncing you guilty and sending you into prison or a dungeon or something like that. It was, you competed, and now it came time in your competition to receive your reward. And so you either receive a reward or you lose the reward. You're never thrown in a punishment for this, and that's for believers. Because all of our punishment was taken by Jesus Christ on the cross when he suffered, he bled, and he died. The wages of my sin was death, and Jesus nailed him to the cross. I will give an account for not, Jesus already paid all that, so I don't give an account for that. I will give an account for what I've done with my brother. And I will either receive a reward for doing wisely, or I will lose my reward for not having done what I had ought to have done. But in Christ, I am eternally secure. He says, act on judgment. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Just like in the day of the great flood, judgment did come because God is holy, he is just, he is righteous, he is true. And there will be an accounting for what we have done. Then he says, act on mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's the trump card, the mercy of God. Jesus told a story. Uh, the people were talking about preferential treatment of people, and, and, and Jesus then told the story. Two men went into the temple to pray. And the one man was a Pharisee. And uh, he was praying his grand and lofty prayer. And this prayer he's saying, thank you, God, that you didn't make me. And he starts listing them off. That I'm not a thief, I'm not a murderer, I'm not an adulterer, and I'm not like this other guy. <laughs> he points them out in his prayer. This, this tax collector. You know, they were the worst of worst in, 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 in the Jewish theology that, of that day. They were traitor, treason against the Jews. Uh, he's, 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 he's lower than a sinner. He's a tax collector. And I'm not like this tax collector. But the man that was a tax collector, he wouldn't even lift up his head. He beat his breast. He rips his garment and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
The word merciful in Greek is propitious. Be propitious to me. The word propitious means accept the sacrifice as being paid in full for me. The sacrifice we know is Jesus. And he says, Jesus said, which of the men do you think went home justified? You see, mercy triumphs judgment every single time. So what can we take away from, from this passage today? I got a few things I think we should take away. Number one, we should act on the word of God. Always, always, always act on the word of God. Secondly, use your freedom to do what is right. Do what is right. Live as if you're going to give an account before God for what you're doing today. Yeah, I'm going to someday give an account for that. Love others like God loved you. Love others. Err on the side of mercy and grace. I call this, in a very simple way, just give the other person the benefit of the doubt. You don't know what's going on in their life. You don't know what's happened. That guy that cuts you off, you know, and you think it's road rage and you want to respond with road rage, you don't know what's going on in that person's life. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Err on the side of mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Err on the side of mercy. Don't be a spiritual snob. Be a spiritual blessing. Be a spiritual blessing. Bless someone. Bless them. Because you don't know what's going on in their life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word is so practical. We pray, Lord, now that as we've looked at this practical instruction from the Word, that as I said last week, we looked in the, the mirror of the Word of God that we won't forget what we, we've just read and looked at, but that we will go out and love our neighbor as ourself. Lord, we won't be partial. We won't be judgmental. Lord, we will love people as we want to be loved. And love you, Lord, as we serve you. In a moment, Lord, we're going to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper. Bless us in this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.